but he has uh, taught at Vassar. Uh, Eamon Grennan is an Irish citizen, but he has uh, taught at Vassar College uh, for many years here in the United States. Uh, he's the author of many books of poetry, uh, most recently Relations, New and Selected Poems, which has generous selection of several of his previous volumes of poetry, as well as some new work. Uh, he's been widely honored, widely published, and uh, one of his poems is called Place. Uh, many of his poems could be named that. Very detailed and loving attention to many places, often in Ireland, sometimes in this country, and the people in those places linked by their human hearts. And a uh, very wonderful poet, I'm pleased to present Eamon Grimm. David, and thanks very much to all the, uh, the groups that were mentioned, the library and the, uh, the, the poets groups and the uh, Pennsylvania Arts Council, what, uh, Arts Council was it? Council. Council, Council, Council of the Arts. Uh, great pleasure to be here in the library. Um, as you can see, if you do have a problem, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I presume it has to keep us in our place to be nice. <laughs> we are reminded of the higher forms uh, right away. Uh, since, since David mentioned that poem, I think I'll, I'll just start by reading that poem. I have a whole heap of stuff. Uh, we're here for two and a half hours, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Midnight. Okay. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll keep my eye on the clock. But uh, since, since you mentioned that poem called Place, and it's a poem I often start with. In fact, I wasn't planning to start with it now, but I will read it. Um, place in question here, but David's right. Uh, um, I am an, I'm Irish. I, I, I have, as I said at dinner, uh, to go home um, at regular intervals for voice transfusions, <laughs> and that's, that's what I sound like I do. Um, but a, 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 the stuff I do tends to move between the two landscapes. I, I, I write quite a lot about what's in, the immediate, in my in, in immediate environment, whether that's Ireland or, um, or America. Uh, and the place involved here, the actual place in the west of Ireland, we were talking about it um, at dinner, in fact, um, out there in Connemara, where I spend as much time as I can, and uh, um, it's rather, not desolate, not a very beautiful place, but uh, it's not my native place, it's a chosen place, I, I come from Dublin. But here's a tiny little uh, watercolour, you might say, of the immediate surroundings, uh, and that have to, I think, is, is charged a bit by the pleasure of getting back there in the summer, in this case. Place. First morning back, there's a faint cap of cloud on the brow of Tully Mountain, flash of a blackbird between sycamore and ash, glint of dew on a few daisies a scythe has spared. Lilies of the valley stand in a battered can. The cover of my mother's prayer book wrinkles with light, and my neighbor's rickety mutt mumbles a crust of stale bread. In early sunshine, the houses across the lake seem solid as chateaus, seem as if they'd stand forever, high-arched, their barns are granaries of light, though the old cottages lie like bones over the open fields. And here, slightly apologetic, comes the cough of the cock pheasant, stepping among potato drills as if he owned the place, crimson and cinnabar his head, his feathers cinnamon and gold. He will hide in his own life down there, where whins and heather and boggy grass can flourish and the sunny morning be sheer heaven to him. I, I should have said, um, when you see a pheasant in that kind of rocky, rather bleak landscape, it really does look like an exotic, which I suppose it was, but they were taken in the 17th century. Uh, but he still looks like, as they say over there, a blow-in, uh, uh, more exotic than uh, the sparrows and stuff that are around, as I feel so, uh, at times myself, I must say, when I get back there. Um, and I should have also mentioned that those cottages were uh, ruined cottages, cottages that are memorials, really, of, uh, um, of poorer times, and sometimes even famine times. Anyway, um, I'm going to read another poem that's set in that similar, in that same landscape, but indoors in this case, kind of early piece, that I call A Gentle Art, and uh, dedicated to my mother. Uh, I was living out there in the 80s, early 80s, I guess, on my own during the winter, or late winter, early spring, and uh, um, had to do things I hadn't done for quite a while since I lived in America, 
uh, had among them lighted fire. Uh, I didn't have to light a fire when I was living over here. Um, so this is about learning how to do that again. A gentle art. I'd been learning how to light a fire again after 30 years. Begin, she'd say, with a bed of yesterday's newspapers. Disasters, weddings, births and deaths. All that everyday black and white of history is first to go up in smoke. The sticks crosswise holding in their dry heads memories of detonating blossom, leaf. Saved from the ashes of last night's fire, arrange the cinders among the sticks, crown them with coal nuggets, handling such antiquity as behooves it, for out of this darkness, light. Look, it's a cold but comely thing I'd put together as my mother showed me, down to sweeping the fireplace clean. Lit, you must cover from view, let it concentrate, some things being better done in secret. Pretend another interest, but never let it slip your mind. Know it's breathing and satisfied. Know it's breathing, its gulps and little gasps, its silence and satisfied whispers, its lapping air. At a certain moment, you may be sure, she'd say, it's caught. Then simply leave it be. It's on its own now, leading its mysterious, hungry life, becoming more itself by the minute, like a child grown up, growing strange. And this is another Ireland-situated poem. I mean, they're not all that. I'll, I'll, I'll get to this part of the world soon. Um, but, uh, and it's, it's a, one of those little memories that one has, and it's attached to smell, as, as quite a number of memories have. Smell is one of those lovely primitive zones. Uh, and a smell quite distinctive. Um, in this case, the smell is the smell of that simple cereal porridge, uh, or what do you call it, oatmeal, right? But porridge is, is, is the right word for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in part, the poem's called Porridge, in part because I, I, I sort of wanted a poem to be called Porridge. It's not, it's not a poetic, it's not a poetic uh, notion. But it's, it's just about being in this country and, uh, um, and a smell kind of uh, projecting me uh, further back into my childhood, really. Um, don't, or don't write much about that, but this is one of the ones I did. And it contains little images, one of uh, my mother. Uh, um, there's something I mentioned in here called Friar's Balsam, which when you had a cold or you were stuffed up, you'd, push in, uh, you'd, you'd put into very hot water and the steam, cover your head with a towel, at least your mother would cover your head with a towel and, and you'd breathe it in. So I have that image of her in here. Just, uh, it's a bit peculiar probably. The other little image is uh, before homogenized milk, uh, uh, the cream would rise to the top of the milk uh, in the bottles we used to get it in anyway. And we were always forbidden to, um, to drink the cream off the top of the milk until you shook it, you know, because uh, otherwise you left them with skim milk basically. <laughs> um, so that's in there too. Uh, that's about it. Well, uh, it's called porridge. While you're cooking breakfast, I follow the thread of its smell back to that first kitchen where porridge bubbled on the aster blue petals of gas. Bland and mealy as flour sacks, the smell used to snake upstairs to where I find myself half dressed, shivering before the electric fire's red gold stems that buzz in blueberry tiles and glow like the statue of the Sacred Heart. Coffee dark was my father's morning scent. Cigarette smoke and the acrid black of toast scorching under the grill. The sharp rasp of his knife scraped burnt <coughs> bits off, butter on, a smell of charcoal mixed with honeyed gold. Tea was what the rest of us drank. No smell, unless I dipped my head, felt steam wreathing cold cheeks my nose opening with the word salon, delicate as the bone china tea set tinted with its apple green leaf we used only on Sunday or for visitors. Sniffing into the cup like that, I picture my mother bowed above the smoky basin of Friar's Balsam, madonnaed by a blue bath towel, her breathing a rich mix of phlegm and prayers for a speedy recovery the bedroom, a dispensary stew of wintergreen, camphor, menthol, blackcurrant, Vicks. 
If I was up first, I'd cat pad downstairs in stocking feet, ease the hall door open to bring in the milk I'd heard the milkman clunk on the porch, empties clinking at his finger ends. It was beginning to brighten. The milk shone white as milk in its slender bottles, and the clop clop of the milkman's horse, loose harness jingling, passed up Clerval Road. Morning smelled froth, a cut crystal scent that said another world existed, clean cold, intricate as a frozen snowflake, somehow parallel to ours, hazardous and dazzling and moonlit fixed forever. Sometimes a fresh olive brown horse turd smoked on the empty street like a burnt offering, its racy breath a summer pungent mix of oats and meadow grass inflaming our tame suburban air. Frost stiffened filaments in my nose, crinkled the leftover roses, salted the lawn, glinted from the grey pavement. Kitchen smells seeping from the house behind me. I'd hug the four cold bottles to my chest, heel the hall door shut and hurry to pour on my porridge the creamy top of the milk, rich, delicious, forbidden, before my mother or my father saw me. Smells of sugar, cream and porridge marry. And I take that wonder in, like nothing special, till here and now I hear you tell me from our kitchen that breakfast's ready, and I rise to join you, my head swimming. That's uh, a, a little evocation of Dublin uh, um, uh, in the in the in the rare old times, as the song says. Um, I'll shift the the angle of the camera just to come to this side of the world, and uh, um, this is a tiny little poem uh, um, that is situated. I, I, I live in Poughkeepsie, and it's situated uh, at home in the house and I'm just waiting for my child who was then about six I guess to come home from school and I know I mean some of you are writers and poets and uh, and artists of one kind or another but, but no matter what you do really you, you when you're absorbed in your work the notion of that is that's a lovely thing that kind of absorption that kind of uh, a cocoon you create around yourself which is then, of course, has to enter into a kind of negotiation with the rest of the world uh, at a moment like this. And that's really all this is about. It's about that kind of uh, moment where uh, uh, the world uh, gets in the way, you might say. It's called Pause. Uh, the weird containing stillness of the neighborhood. Just before the school bus brings the neighborhood kids home in the middle of the cold afternoon. A moment of pure waiting anticipation before the outbreak of anything when everything seems just seems justified just hanging in the wings about to happen and in your mind you see the flashing lights flare amber to scarlet and your daughter in her blue jacket and white fringed sapphire hat step gingerly down and out into our world again and hurry through silence and snow grass as the bus door sighs shut and her own front door flies open and she finds you behind it, father in waiting, the stillness in bits, and the common world restored as you bend to touch her, take her hat and coat from the floor where she's dropped them, hear the live voice of her filling every crack. In the pause before all this happens, you know something about the shape of the life you've chosen to live, between the silence of almost infinite possibility and that explosion of things as they are, those vast, unanswerable intrusions of love and disaster, or just the casual scatter of your child's winter clothes on the hall floor. Kira, which is the child's name, uh, said when I read it to her, I don't put them on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> she, said, <laughs> I, I, she said, no, I don't throw them on the floor. She said, I, I put them on the stairs. <laughs> I tried to uh, uh, explain poetic license to her, but she wasn't buying it. Um, anyway, uh, 
let's see. I'll do a little one that comes back, that still remains on this side. Uh, today is Veterans Day, right? Or Poppy Day, or Armistice Day. So today, Rich Peace brought out. Uh, just around now, actually, 11, 11, 11, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, um, I, 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 coming out of the Irish situation, okay, I have a, a certain number of poems, but that wor work very uh, indirectly and obliquely into the situation of Irish um, difficulty uh, and violence. Um, but this is a poem I wrote not about that by any means, but triggered in some ways by, prompted in some ways by something connected with it. Uh, it was really stimulated by just watching some men, uh, um, men uh, m making a roof on one of the buildings where I teach up there in Vassar College, a number of buildings. And this was a building called Chicago Hall which had a kind of sloped, uh, a, a sort of waving roof. Um, and it is the building that houses the um, foreign languages department. So there's uh, various kinds of um, antennae on the roof, okay, because they would get foreign languages in. So that comes into it. Um, I think that's about it, except that uh, the poem is dedicated to Seamus Heaney, uh, who, whose poems themselves uh, are, are kind of uh, um, in favor, as you might say, of Piece, and who has one particular poem which I like very much, lots of it is I like, but uh, one called um, um, The Thatchers, Thatching, Thatching, it's called Thatching a Roof, so this is called Men Roofing. Bright burnished day, they are laying fresh roof down on Chicago Hall. Tight cylinders of tarred felt paper lean against one another on the cracked black shingles that shroud those undulant ridges. Two squat drums of turmix catch the light. A fat canister of gas gleams between a heap of old tires and a paunchy plastic sack, beer bottle green. A TV dish antenna stands propped to one side, a harvest moon cocked to passing satellites and steadfast stars. Gutters overflow with starlings, lit wings and whistling throats going like crazy. A plume of blue smoke feathers up from a pitch-black cauldron, making the air fragrant and medicinal as my childhood's was, with tar. Overhead, against the gentian sky, a sudden first flock whirls of amber leaves and saffron quick as breath, fine as origami birds. Watching from a window opposite, I see a man in a string vest glance up at these exalted leaves, kneel to roll a roll of tar felt flat. Another tilts a drum of tar mix till a slow boat of black silk oozes, spreads. One points a silver hose and conjures from its nozzle a fretted, trembling orange lick of fire. The fourth one dips to the wrist in the green sack and scatters two brimming fistfuls of granite grit. Broadcast, the bright grain dazzles on black. They pause, straighten, study one another, a segment done. I can see the way the red-bearded one in the string vest grins and slowly whets his two stained palms along his jeans. I see the one who cast the grit walk to the roof edge, look over, then with a little lilt of the head spit contemplatively down. What a sight between earth and air they are, drenched in sweat and sunlight, relaxed masters for a moment of all our elements. Here is my image, given, of the world at peace, men roofing, taking pains to keep the weather out, simmering in ripe Indian summer light, winter on their deadline minds. Briefly, they stand balanced between our common ground and nobody's sky, then move again to their appointed tasks and stations, as if they were amazing strangers, come to visit for a brief spell our familiar shifty climate of blown leaves, bird spin. Odorous, their lazuli column of smoke loops up from the dark heart of their mystery, and they ply. They intercede. 
I should have said, probably, uh, uh, there's something as I was reading that I noted about um, that tar, I call the tar medicinal, the smell of tar medicinal, which I presume Philip Morris would love to hear. But uh, um, in fact, when we were kids, uh, we used to go behind these tar, uh, uh, the, 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 the lorries that were laying down the tar and smell it, because our mother's told us it's very healthy for you. The smell of tar, I don't know. <laughs> where they got this myth. But anyway, so therefore the smell of tar became medicinal. Uh, and, and also that image of men on a roof was always fascinating to me. Something heroic and male about it, I suppose. But in this case, they are males uh, um, active in the cause of peace, or at least active in the cause of keeping the, uh, keeping the weather out. Um, I have another little poem about men working, which I'll, which I'll, which I'll read. Uh, it's also not just about men working, I guess it's about something ordinary. I guess a lot of the stuff I do, a lot of the poems I do, um, try to take something fairly common, fairly ordinary, and uh, see into it, or see it, basically see it, uh, um, um, as clearly as I can. And in this case, what I'm looking at, again, I'm perched at the window, uh, the, the voyeur's, the voyeur's nesting place. I'm at the window looking out. And what I see is the, uh, the garbage collection going by. And I, I look at it carefully. And I sort of turn it into, in the poem, something like The Last, the last Judgment. Uh, so the notion, uh, that's my religious upbringing, of The Last Judgment as the garbage collection is, uh, I suppose, <laughs> fair enough. Um, but uh, um, you probably know the, the, the Greek for, a I mean, the word angels, angelos, is, 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 is Greek. And it means messenger really. And I use the word covening as a verb, you know, which is covening, uh, that, that coven, I, I use that as a verb. Uh, it's called, uh, which is where I live, Wing Road. Amazing how the young man who empties our dustbin ascends the truck as it moves away from him, rises up like an angel in a china blue check shirt and lilac woolen cap, dirty work gloves, Rowan Berry red bandana, flapping at his throat. He plants one foot above the mudguard, locks his left hand to a steel bar, stemming from the dumper's loud mouth, and is borne away, light as a cat, right leg dangling, the dazzled air snatching at that black bearded face. He breaks to a smile, leans wide, and takes the morning to his puffed chest, right arm stretched far out, a checkered china blue wing, gliding between blurred earth and heaven, a messenger under the locust trees that stand in silent panic at his passage. But his mission is not among the trees. He has flanked both sunlit rims of wing road with empty dustbins, each lying on its side, its battered lid fallen beside it, each letting noonlight scour its emptiness to shining. <coughs> Carried off in a sudden cloud of diesel smoke, a woeful crying out of brakes and gears, a roaring of monstrous mechanical appetite. He has left this unlikely radiance straggled behind him, where the crows covening in branches will flash and haggle. I remember somebody writing about this poem uh, and saying that the crows at the end were like the... Uh, but like, it's a great what criticism can do, uh, were like the, uh, the, the soldiers at the foot of the cross, okay, uh, dicing for uh, the garments of, of Christ. But I thought, well, grand, you know, I mean, if that's, a, <laughs> if that's, a, that, that's what you fancy. Uh, but the critical, the critical mind is capable of uh, uh, more invention than the poet's mind uh, much of the time. Um, this is a little, this is a little piece, um, yeah, okay, it's not quite that little, but it's, it's not a long poem by any means. It's a small poem, again, it's set in Dublin, it moves back, in, again, it's indoors, and again, it's his childhood, and it is a memory of, a, of, of, uh, it's a memory, uh, in this case, the woman in the poem, it's a memory of her, uh, um, waiting for the man, waiting for the husband, waiting for the father to come home, so it's called Night Figure. She hovers over the ache of thresholds, that brass doorknob and the cream paint chipped at the jam, 
enter her face again, so close she doesn't notice. She needs to hear us breathing, the three of us, pitching into sleep in the one room, tucked in by a faint smell of face powder, sticky touch of lips. Snare beat of rain on the roof, the rain spitting against the window. It's spilling rain, she'd say to herself. He'll be drowned out in it. As if underwater, she <coughs> stands listening to the house and all its stunned tongues gather round her heart. Rumours of being rush into the instant. A bus coughs by on Clerval Road. Quick steps syncopate through rain. A bicycle bell jings in the dark. Squeak, squeak of pebbles against wind and hill. When she moves into their front bedroom, she sees from the window a hurrying figure, hears the little brickish click that high heels make on stone. A deep pain starts to open her heart, and she's the secret goings-on in hives, a slow gathering and translation, the finished, overflowing, golden cone. Nothing now, nothing, till his key comes fumbling the hall door, the sudden rush of air as the door shuffles open, raw against the hall's linoleum. A hint of stagger in the hallway, heavy sit in the muffled chair, his knitted eyes haze over, blinking, two hearts heaving like mad. Behind closed doors, the air listens to a huffle of voices. She can feel when the petals of pain and rage have closed again her vacant relief. The house complete at last. She can sleep. So, she lies beside his breath, her eyes open, and our house a hive of silence round her head, her splitting head. Fingernails of rain are tapping for help against the window. Let us in. Let us in, can't you? Then thickened silence levels the dark, taking the bed she lies on, and she slides, nothing stops her, into the wooden dusk of wardrobes, down the sheer drop of sleep. Here's, here's a, a short little piece that uh, was mentioned at dinner. Jack McGregan uh, mentioned it, so I'll read it. All right. Um, this, is, this is, it's called Obad, so it's a dawn poem. Um, and, the, and, the, and the locus of it is the, is the strand out there in the west of Ireland. Walking Renvile Strand at Sunno, I see a gull that's in the right place at the right time, turned to a bird of fire for a second. And here on a slope of sand, I see an otter must have had to scramble, his big foot dragging, his unwavering concentration still stapled to the prey he must be, whatever the word for it, imagining, its flesh and blood a little continuous detonation in his brain, the salt blue hugeness of the Atlantic, only a cloak he wears at dusk and dawn. Thereness is all, it seems. That burn of chance, that quickened breath of appetite adding up to what this world offers, glitter and shadow, pang of absence, the way this day keeps coming on, we meet, we disappear. Um, I was always frightened of, of horses as a kid. Still am, really. Horses are huge things, right? And uh, not to be tangled with. But um, it's funny, you know, things that lodge, like that roofing thing, you know. Um, I was always fascinated by the image of, of men on a roof. But it took me 45 years, 40 years anyway, to before 45 years, before it ever became uh, something I, I found a voice for. You know, I think that happens when you're writing and maybe in any art really something lodges in you like a like a like a like a little grit a little bit of grit i suppose uh, um, and your experience sort of uh, weaves around it and horses wear that too 
And then, um, after my mother died, um, I wrote this poem about horses. I was, it, was, it was prompted by, again, I was out in the west of Ireland there, and I just saw a horse, a mare, and, and its foal in a field. Okay, and they were just in the field. So the, the poem kind of came out of just seeing that, but it's kind of in the wake, you might say, of, of the death of a parent. So I think that, I think in some ways that, uh, uh, that, uh, um, um, prompt, that, that energizes it in a certain way, you know, fuels it. Um, I don't think there's anything to, to explain about it. Otherwise, it's in three bits, like a little triptych. I'm just uh, saying one, two, three. Horses. One. Although they seldom muscled above me, I remember being dwarfed always in the stone fountain of their force, rawly afraid, awestruck at something vast, a violence harnessed and hauling a cart of scrap metal through our tidy suburb, men with wild, weather-beaten faces snapping the reins. The next thick-branching grace, I remember, and the fleshed bones in their legs that I saw from the footpath, or once watching a blacksmith bend to them in a forge in Terenur and lift one and fold it neatly over in his aproned lap and touch the crescent foot with a big file or pliers, the instrument a glimmer in his blunt hand, the whole horse bulk rippling into shadow. A few times, too, I felt tender, rough lips touch my hand that held, flat-handed, a snatch of grass, fearing the teeth but staying still until grass gone in a quick crunch, I had my hand back to pat the silky nose, finger comb the mane, slap sleek hindquarters and the belly big as a curruck, to feel the heat simmering there, the nervous flickering along skin as if the veins were charged, the blood itself electric, and knowing how heavy the flesh was from the way my hand lay on it, like nothing, a straw on water. I'd imagine it all falling on me, or being lost under a flail of hooves, the feel of so much live, involuntary flesh capsized over my own bones in a fury of bared gums, a trampling froth storm white at the mouth, two black, moon-mad eyes on fire. Two. Remote, perfect, overwhelming, how they inhabit space, by crowding out the air they occupy, and yet contained, confined inside some glorious force field of their own, a solidified smell of oats, sweat, leather, contemplation, astonishment. The span and ponder of them absolute in anchorage, taut as propellers, steady in that massive confidence of rump and hindquarters, thews bulging, everything sinewy, roped, rounded as seashells, the grand parallelogram of the head giving millstone definition to the word skull. Three. Two white horses in a field up the road, a mare and her coat gleaming out of the clouded day at grass in a windless wide silence, the tenderness between them palpable as that mild and serious something in an empty chapel. The young one is lying down while his mother browses a close circle round him. But when she stops to stare at the sound my footsteps make on the road beyond the hedge, at the edge of their world, the little one rises too and stands looking, his two coal black eyes lingering on my strange shape, letting out of his lustrous ebony muzzle a faint, plaintive, interrogative quickering. I know they're abroad in every weather, winds snapping at all corners of the valley, rain squalls making ditches roar, sunshine cooking the air in clover. And it is for them only weather to be taken with the same dense patience they proffer to whatever happens. Although at intervals under a heavy shower, after they've been standing as still as creatures carved in quartz, the mare will suddenly toss and gallop round the fuchsia bush and barbed wire border of the field, her coat quickly following, his new legs slow and a little stiff at first, but then with a springy kicking bound and a careless, elegant animation of everything that makes the body 
and the body move. He'll cut to a perfect dash, tucked tight <coughs> to, to a tandem gallop, doubling his mother on the run, picking up as he goes whatever he knows from her, but first how to warm the blood she's given him, and then how to be increasingly in the world. Right, I'll, I'll shift it a little, uh, yes, uh, the slightly more, all those familial and landscape stuff, a slightly more erotic tinge to another, another uh, um, now, this is the PG related, uh, <laughs> but they're not, not really. Um, this is called w w Woman at Lit Window, needs no explanation, but it, it does remind us, sometimes you're looking out a window, sometimes you're looking in a window, and uh, in each case I presume. Uh, uh, you're aware of some kind, but this is that kind of poem. Woman at Lit Window. It's also, it's also that kind of a poem that, that uh, is, at least reveals in me, there's some, there's some sort of frustrated painter in me. I couldn't paint for, you know, for anything at all. But uh, uh, um, I, I write quite a lot about painters, or a certain amount anyway about painters, and every so often I'll write a poem that works to kind of create a painterly feel. And I think this is one of those, and I think it's, it's quite um, explicitly one of those. So you see in this image, and you want to kind of capture its surfaces. Woman at lit window. Perhaps if she stood for an hour like that, and I could stand to stand in the dark, just looking, I might get it right. Every fine line in place. The veins of the hand reaching up to the blind cord, etch of the neck in profile the white and violet shell of the ear in its whorl of light, that neatly circled strain against a black cotton sweater. For a few seconds she is staring through me, where I stand wondering what I'll do if she starts on that stage of light taking her clothes off. But she only frowns out at nothing or herself in the glass. And I think I could if we stood for an hour like this, get some of the real details down. But already, even as she lowers the blind, she's turning away, leaving a blank, ivory square of brightness to float alone in the dark, the faint, grey outline of the house around it. Newly risen, a half-moon casts my shadow on the path, glazed with grainy radiance, as I make my slow way back to my own place among the trees, a host of fireflies in fragrant silence and native ease pricking the dark around me with their pulse, ungovernable, of life. You don't have to be told, I take it, that, that what the fireflies are doing when they're exercising their pulse of light like that is discovering a mate, okay, so they, they, they sleep and then uh, Mrs. Firefly, or Ms. Firefly, uh, finds it over here and signals back, and they're on the right kind of frequency. Uh, this isn't how humans uh, are allowed to do it, one might say. Um, anyway, that's the, that's the Firefly at that, uh, at that moment. And um, here's another, another one in a similar kind of vein. Uh, I remember reading this one time, and, and I know students had read it, and they thought it was a religious poem. But maybe. Oasis. To enter this cool space settles the stutter of nerves that has taken your gaze from the tall blue fall of mountains in the distance. You step into a ring of shade in which you find this deep, reflective, necessary source. This simple joy the committed body catches at as if at the last gasp First, the felt luxury of shadow, its way of slowing you down to know what flesh is again. Then, that sound the pool makes, stirring at its banks and from the heart. Water. You keep saying its wedded syllables as if they were enough, their open and closing vowels a cry before satisfaction. Though when you reach its very self, the hard, bright splash of it, it's something speechless, simply known, the fluent, pure give of it, 
first to the fever of your skin, and after to that naive but greedy need your tongue knows. It fills, overspills the heart in your mouth, like another life, gasping all its secrets at once, and everything grows clear as day breaking through muslin curtains to keep you here, where breath swims in the saturated radiance we came from, as if two could go on saying at the same time the one good word. I wrote a, quite a number of poems one time in one of those books um, that were poems of, uh, were, were elegies, right, death parents mainly, but also some friends. And then in the uh, second part of the book, I tended to write poems that were kind of trying to anchor the self, the horses was one of them, anchor the self in ordinary stuff again, after <coughs> meditating on death quite a lot of the time. And uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, a couple of those. Um, at, uh, paying attention, as it were, to the ordinary stuff. Um, but with in mind something of the um, pressures of mortality, I suppose, in some ways. The first of these is called Shed. And it's just a little thing. Um, one time, uh, uh, the, the, the little shed, woodshed really, um, the, uh, uh, near the, in the garden where I live, was knocked down by a tree in a storm. So, and, and that was fine. But then when spring came around, I saw something. Uh, that emerged out of this little ruin, and so that's where the point comes from. Shed, which is a verb to right. Uh, you wouldn't know it had been there at all ever. The small woodshed by the side of the garage that a falling storm struck bow demolished some seasons back. The space and remains now overcome by weeds, choke cherries, wild rose brambles. But at the verge of where it stood, a peach tree I'd never seen a sign of before has pushed its skinny trunk and sparse-leaved branches up above that clutter into the thoroughfare of light and given us this fall a small basketful of sweet fruit the raccoons love too and sit at midnight savouring, spitting the stones down where the shed used to stand, those bony seeds ringing along the metal ghost of the roof, springing into the dark. And uh, along with the raccoons and the peaches and so on, I also have had, had occasion to look rather closely at some ants. Uh, ants are our friends from summertime. Uh, and uh, one of the things we know about ants, which is brought home to you when you check out a piece of amber and it says, with, the, uh, with a little ant encased in it, and it says 80 million years old or something. And you decide they were here a good bit before us. And the likelihood is, as we know, they'll be here a good deal after us. So this kind of gives you a perspective. You know, thinking about ants gives you a touch of perspective on human mortality. So that, that was one of these uh, sort of prods to the poem, prompts to the poem. And another, uh, well, then I, me I, me I, I, I mentioned a number of names in here. I just mentioned them. Antinous was uh, uh, a very beautiful man. Uh, the beloved of Hadrian, the emperor, he was a soldier, and I've seen statues and so on, he was gorgeous, uh, and, but died very young and was buried in, in Egypt. And he's only a name in here, but uh, um, he becomes an image of, of, of early death. And then I mentioned Alcibiades, who was uh, that man that uh, um, Socrates loved in, in, in Platonic dialogues, young man. And uh, I mentioned Isaac, you know, Abraham and Isaac, that kind of stuff. Um, and I mentioned something called honeydew. Yeah, honeydew, not the melon, but the stuff that, uh, um, that ants excrete uh, uh, to feed. Or maybe the queen does it, I can't remember, to feed the, uh, the infants. Ants. You will have noticed the extraordinary invention of my titles, right? Horses, <laughs> ants, uh, right? Porridge. Uh, anyway, here's ants. A black one drags the faded remains of a moth backwards over pebbles under blades of grass. Frantic with invention, it is a seething gene of stubborn order, its code containing no surrender, only this solitary working frenzy that's got you on your knees with wonder, 
peering into the sheer impedimentary soul in things and into the gimlet will that dredges the dead moth to where they're dwelling. The queen's fat heart like a jellied engine throbbing at the heart of it, her infants simmering towards the light. Under table suspects something and hurries away. One of its ancestors walked all over the eyes of Antinous, tickled Isaac's throat, or scuttled across the pulse of Alcibiades, turning up at the cross with a taste for blood. In a blink, one enters your buried mother's left nostril, brings a message down to your father's spine and shiny clavicle, or spins as if dizzy between your lover's salt breasts, running its quick and different body, ragged over the hot tract of her, scrupulous and obsessive into every pore. And here's one in your hairbrush, nibbling at filaments of lost hair, dandruff flakes, the very stuff of your gradual dismantling. Soap, sugar, a pale fleck of semen, or the blood drop from a <coughs> mouse the cat has carried in. It's all one grist to this mill that makes from our minute leftovers a tenacious state of curious arrangements. The males used up in copulation, females in work, life itself a blind contract between honeydew and carrion. The whole tribe surviving in that complex gap where horror and the neighborly virtues, as we'd say, adjust to one another and without question. So you'll never look at an ant the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll read a, few, a couple more. Um, one is uh, I'll read one and then uh, end with a couple of small ones. The uh, I have a son who who was at school in uh, I'd uh, ri written quite a number of poems as uh, um, uh, of children of my own children. Um, I guess it's like any artist, if, if you are, you, 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 you do what's in front of you, and your kids are in front of you quite a lot, more than you might want, in fact, some of the time, uh, but we won't say that. Um, but the, the, a lot of the stuff that I've written uh, that concerns my own children um, occupies itself with them at curious little threshold moments, moments of departure, you know, uh, kissing somebody goodbye at a train station, Bringing, bringing a kid to school, or those moments when as parents we are at the threshold of the recurrent phenomenon of being a parent, which is the valedictory phenomenon, the phenomenon of saying goodbye. Uh, that, there you are. That's, that's how it has to be. That's, that's the image of it. Now, uh, this child uh, went away uh, to school and came back and told me, he went to UVA and uh, told me uh, about a little escapade, which I turned into one of these moments. Uh, I mean, it meant something to me, so I brooded on it for a while. Um, and UVA is a very beautiful campus, as you may know, uh, designed by Thomas Jefferson, right? So it's, uh, which they, they call Mr. Jefferson. Uh, I don't know, in their first year. The, you know, it's all these kind of uh, um, rituals and traditions there. Well, it's got a very beautiful neoclassic campus, at the center piece of which is a great lawn, at one end of which is a rotunda building with lovely neoclassic pillars and another, another kind of neoclassic building and a statue of Homer. And this beautiful lawn is the focus of a number of rituals. Among them, this one, uh, the ritual of streaking. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, because he came home and said, we streaked the lawn. I said, Grant, uh, that was nice. uh, presumably it's forbidden. But he said, well, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't uh, too dangerous because we did it at night. And we also did it uh, during the, when everybody had left, OK? I mean, it was uh, during the break. I said, well, fair enough, OK. Uh, the, the, but the moment, as he told it to me, became something of some uh, um, importance to me, um, which, I will, which I will share with you now. Um, Homer, yeah, I said there's a statue of Homer and his dogs, uh, and his dog, rather, there too. I think that's all to say about it, and I'll otherwise just read it. It's called Streak of Light. After a party to celebrate the midterm break, you and your friends stripped after midnight and streaked from one end of that great lawn to the other, from the dignified rotunda pillars to the bronze tip of Homer's nose, and streaked over the prospect Mr. Jefferson laid out, who never imagined the moonlit spectacle of six young first-year men in their pelts flashing across the grass on goat feet 
dashing to touch the poet's nose and back over frosted grass to the steps, the safety of their clothes again, breathless, the deed done. Thinking about it, it's only your body I see, and only in shrapnel flashes, the streaking light of it on light feet, your red head thrown forward, netting specks of moonfire, the long strides and solid thighs of you, stretched fingers tipping bronze as you turn a runner, something Greek, your sex chilled by night and frost, but still in its strength, sending you headlong through the dark like a cast spear in Homer, glimmering and singing its flight. The moon is remote, neoclassical, over where, among the young men loudly hurrying into their clothes, you catch your breath. And I find, however it is, the rest of your life branching from this rite of frosted passage, this caper that stays in my mind as an image of separation, the sight of your freshly stubbled face a light like that, your vulnerable buttocks, the fleet gleaming ghost of you, disappearing through air the frost has turned to frost to icy water, and I stare, rejoicing as if I just hugged and waved you off on some extraordinary venture, stare after you even after the night has done what it has to do and swallowed you, even after that last glimmer is gone from my eye. Okay, I'll end with these couple of little poems. Um, both of them are little 13 line poems and each takes place, both take place up in Provincetown in the winter. Uh, uh, some of you may have been there, it's very, very beautiful and it has beautiful dunes and these two poems are just kind of little, uh, little uh, um, miniature watercolours or something out of that landscape. But it's a landscape in which when I looked at stuff I tried to charge it a little bit with um, with a sort of emblematic kind of pressure, you know, seeing things to mean other things in a certain way. Um, this, this one is called, so the birds fascinated me as well, and these two points concern the birds in the winter. Uh, this one's called Artist at Work. Wallace Stevens is a poem called Poetry is a Destructive Force. And, and maybe this is uh, um, 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 a sort of a little footnote to that. It's called Artist at Work. On slow wings, the marsh hawk is patrolling possibility, soaring, sliding down almost to ground level, twisting suddenly at something in the marsh hay or dune grass, their colours old copper, straw gold, shining in his eye, where he finds the slightest aberration, any stir that isn't the wind's doing, and abruptly plunges on it. Then, if he's lucky, and that scuttling minutiae of skin and innards, its hot pulse hammering, isn't, he will settle there and take in what's happened, severing the head first, then ripping the bright red strings that keep the blood in check, then heart, gizzard, eyes, and so to the bones, cracking and snapping each one that moved so swift and silent and sure of itself only a minute ago in the sheltering grass. And this is uh, about a couple of birds. And it's also about, there's lots of writers here, uh, something we all know, presumably, that when you, uh, that, that the thing you're trying to do when you, when you, when you do something, a poem, pr uh, a story, or, or a painting or something, it, the thing that comes out isn't the thing you were trying to do. You're, you're deflected very often in a good way by the accidental um, and by, and by something that comes up from the unconscious very often. So th this is how I charge this particular little ordinary event. Uh, um, not so ordinary for the birds involved, but ordinary in the sense that it happens all the time. Um, and it's called Lesson. I was watching a robin fly after a finch, the smaller bird chirping with excitement, the bigger its breast blazing, silent, in light-winged, earnest, chase. When out of nowhere, over the chimneys and the shivering front gardens, flashes a sparrow hawk headlong. A light brown burn, scorching the air from which it simply plucks like a ripe fruit the stocked robin, whose two or three cheeps of terminal surprise twinkle in the silence, closing over the empty street when the birds have gone about their own business. And I began to understand how a poem can happen. 
You have your eye on a small, elusive detail pursuing its music when a terrible truth strikes and your heart cries out, being carried off. Yeah, thank you. some books for sale and I'm sure we'll be glad to sign them and answer any questions, uh, talk with you. We'll have some refreshments if you give it